we go. All right, so today, um, the subject that we're going to talk about is how to use the 4-H curriculum that exists in your county offices in order to make sure uh, that you can enhance project meetings. I can't tell you how many times, maybe even the past month, that people have told me how much they don't like curriculum um, or the curriculum that we offer. And it makes me sad because I think um, the curriculum that we have is actually really well if you can figure out how to use it and what you can do with it. So hopefully today I can share a little bit about how I think it could be used and just kind of give you an overview of what it looks like so that if you are looking for ways to enhance project learning for either your own children or other children in your 4-H club, you kind of know where to go and what to do. So, I'm going to start a little bit talking about why the curriculum is maybe something that you might want to use. And in 4-H, we do something a little bit different than other organizations like Girl Scouts or um, maybe a church group that you have. And we use something called PYD. So I'm going to ask you to check out the um, chat box. And does anybody uh, have any ideas about what PYD stands for? So if you can write that in the chat box, any guesses for what PYD stands for? Come on, I know some of you out there know because there, we have some educators on. So any idea what PYD stands for? All right, well, maybe your fingers will get typing as we go on, but PYD stands for um, Positive Youth Development. And so our goal is basically that we figure out how to use young people in the most productive way to make their experience the best for them. There you go, Jim wrote down Positive Youth Development. So what are the nuts and bolts of PYD? Basically, we wanna make sure that the youth in our program are engaged as partners. So we're working with them, not for them. That's really important as a leader to make sure that you're not the one lecturing and telling them everything, that it's actually an involved process with both the young people and the leaders. We also wanna make sure that they're connected to positive experiences and relationships and environments. This is where you come in hugely because we rely on leaders in our program to make sure that those positive relationships and experiences are happening. We have over 6,000 young people in our program, and we only have 23 staff members throughout the state, maybe 25 on a, on a good day. Um, and we have a few people here at the state office, but really in order to reach those 6,000 kids, we need all of you to help provide those experiences and relationships. So we also need to make sure that in our program that youth are valued and their opinions are valued, and that we allow them to attend and actually participate and contribute and lead. And so as you're thinking about ways to use the curriculum, think about ways that young people can teach some of these aspects or how they can share the things that they're learning within the curriculum. Also, part of our program that makes us a little bit different is that we focus on four essential elements, which means that we should have four things that we really incorporate into what we're doing. And if you've heard me talk before, um, I'm a big component of talking about this over and over and over again. So you may have heard these things already, but I want to make sure that we just really have a better understanding that they need to be part of what we're doing. And those four things, you can see them on the puzzle pieces, but here I'll put them in big letters, um, is independence, belonging, generosity, and mastery. So we need to look for ways to, to have a chance to be independent, make their own decisions. Uh, we want them to belong to a bigger group like the 4-H program. We want to provide them with ways to give back or give be generous. And then we would provide them with a way to master a skill, which is really what this what curriculum can do for young people is that mastery thing is key. So we work on getting our young people hooked um, by providing them with projects. Nobody decides they want to join 4-H to learn record keeping. They join 4-H because they want to show a steer or they want to learn how to sew a dress or they want to learn how to cook something. Um, those are the project skills that get them hooked or get them involved in 4-H. And here are some, just two examples of project skills, woodworking, measuring, sawing, um, sanding, applying a finish, and clothing, cutting a pattern, laying out material. Whatever project you happen to be involved in, I'm sure you can come up with those project skills in your head um, as to what those kids are learning, the basics they're learning. The ultimate goal of 4-H though is these things are great, but how many of us are maybe gonna be woodworkers for the rest of our lives? Some of those skills might be helpful if we're gonna refinish some furniture, but most of us aren't gonna spend tons of time in our adult life trying to learn to saw a straight line or applying a finish. Um, we may learn how to do a hem because our pants need hemming, or putting on a button, but we're probably not gonna spend a lot of time cutting a pattern or laying out material um, long-term. However, what we can do is we can really um, target these skills, the life skills um, for young people as we do project work. Um, so if you look on there, some of them that might be really easy is marketable skills. How often in our livestock projects are youth marketing their product? 
Um, another one on there is stress management. Think about when fair time comes and we enrolled in like 10 projects and we only have one done the night before. Helping youth understand one, maybe they shouldn't have signed up for 10 projects, but two, how do we manage that stress level within um, our lives to make sure that we're not um, making unhealthy life choices or maybe doing things that aren't good for our personal being? And we can do this through something called the experiential learning model. And the concept of this is that youth do, which is what the curriculum does. It gives us activities to do, but the curriculum also gives us a chance to reflect on what we've done and then apply it to our lives. And this model kind of has been adapted for 4-H. So here's a really good way to kind of see what that looks like for the 4-H program. So in the first step, youth experience something. So they perform an activity, they maybe bake a cake, um, they mix a feed ration, they identify a breed, um, and then we give them a time to share what they've learned. Why did you, know, why did you think that was a Berkshire hog? Why did you um, put baking soda in your cake? Or if your cake didn't turn out, you know, maybe what happened? And then we have a chance to process. Um, maybe why did the cake turn out? Um, what kind of things did we learn throughout what we did? And then how do we apply that to life? So maybe when we were baking the cake, we were hurried because we had to get done because we had an hour for our project meeting. And how does that apply to other parts of our lives that if we don't spend the right amount of time reading directions and following directions and taking our time that maybe things don't always turn out. So I just told you tons of information that maybe doesn't make sense to you, but I just want to kind of lay the framework to the curriculum that we do use. So the curriculum is here to help you make sure that you um, do PYD practices or positive development practices within your 4-H project meetings, or if your young person doesn't have a leader, how they can do that. Most of the curriculum, and I'll, I'll kind of preface this as I show you some of it, is based on latest research-based knowledge. All of it provides you with hands-on activities to do. Um, for the most part, it'll have uh, actual questions and ways to do that experiential learning, the do, reflect, apply model. It actually, most of the time, gives you opportunities to practice generosity and mastery, and all of it is life skill related. So what I'm looking at, and this is, you can see right here on the screen is the photography curriculum. We'll take a look at that tonight. We'll take a look at a few other curriculums also. So when should you use curriculum? When is it really great to use? Well, curriculum is great if you're a volunteer who has limited knowledge about a subject matter. Your daughter or your daughter's friend really wants to do pigs, but you literally know nothing about pigs or they really wanna do aerospace. That's a great one. Aerospace, what even is it? It's about rockets and, and planes, and a lot of us don't know a lot about that. However, the curriculum in there that can basically walk you from beginning to end, so you as a person who knows nothing about something can teach a young person about whatever subject it is that they wanna know. Um, it may be helpful also if you're a volunteer who knows tons, maybe you're an um, aeronautics person who studied, who studied um, planes, but you really don't know how to work with kids. You have your own kids, but aren't sure how to take the information that you know and teach it to young people. So this would be a great way to use curriculum too. Um, and probably one of the best ways for the curriculum that we have developed is if a young person doesn't have a leader and they wanna learn more. Also often we have young people sign up and they say, you know, I wanna learn about aerospace and then there's nobody there to teach them. And then basically they have a terrible 4-H experience because nobody shares with them. That curriculum is out there to help them learn and they basically just struggle and don't even know what they're supposed to do. So if you have a child or if you have a kid in your club that really enters a project that maybe you don't know anything about and you don't have a leader, providing them or telling them about the curriculum that they can use is gonna be a great way to help them be able to actually have a positive project experience that they might not have if they don't have somebody to kind of help and guide them through that. I found that the best projects are the ones where a leader is there to work one-on-one -on -one with a kid but we know that that's not always going to happen. And so giving them this curriculum and, and helping them understand that you can work through it, it's kind of like a workbook um, that they could do that on their own and then they could um, share their learning through different opportunities at their club or at the fair. They can use the curriculum to do that. So there's also times, and this is where I think people get frustrated with the curriculum, there's times where you probably need to be more creative um, when working with the curriculum. And one of those is when you have youth with a wide range of knowledge and ages. And this is hard. I always think the best part about 4-H is that we have kids that are in a room together that are 8 to 18. And the hardest part about 4-H is that we have kids that are in a room together that are 8 to 18. And so they all have different wants, needs, desires as far as what they want to learn in their projects. And so there are some, we'll talk a little bit today about how to use the curriculum with that kind of a situation. Um, the curriculum might not work best for you either if you have an idea of what you want to share. 
um, but the curriculum doesn't match your vision. If you're teaching about aerospace and you really want to just focus on rockets, you'll find that the curriculum really covers planes, helicopters, birds, anything that flies. And so if you just want to spend the six weeks or six meetings that you're meeting with kids or however many hours you're able to meet with them just focusing on rockets, you could take parts of the curriculum, but you're going to find that it probably doesn't match your vision exactly the way you want it to. Um, the curriculum was also written to kind of grow um, from very basic knowledge to being a mastery of what's going on. And so it may not work also if you have older youth who want to branch out more, but I think you'll find that there's some ways that you can use the curriculum to help them do that also. So I also want to talk about the purpose of the curriculum because I think people, this is another reason why people maybe don't think it's the best thing for them to use. What's the purpose of it? The purpose is really to provide educational knowledge about a project area. The curriculum does not teach you how to show an animal. People don't look to it to be like, how am I going to do showmanship? How am I going to win? How am I going to feed it right? That's not what it's for. It's more about general knowledge of swine or general knowledge of um, computers or whatever it is that you want to learn. It's not going to teach you a specific how to use your Mac. It's going to teach you more about coding and things like that if you're looking into the computer curriculum. Um, it's not going to teach you how to gain a competitive edge in the show ring. Um, there are other people at other clinics and things that can do that for you. And it's not going to give you step-by-step -step instructions for how to make a fair project. Some of the curriculum actually does that, but for the most part, the goal is that they're providing you with a knowledge base to help you share the things that you're learning with others and maybe then think about things you can do related to fair projects. So going into it, if you're looking for a, something that's gonna tell you how to show your animal, which animal to pick out, um, how to make that for a fair project, that's not gonna be helpful if that's what you want the curriculum to do. So I wanna take um, a look at the curriculum. And so the first, this is going to be the hard part of tonight's presentation is I need to share lots of um, different screens. So please bear with me the best I can to see what I can do. Today. So I'm going to start by sharing um, a different screen with you. So hopefully you can all see it. Um, this is our project um, page. Can everybody see the project page? If I bring in the thumbs up so I know. Hopefully. Okay, perfect. So this is new. If you haven't been on our website, it's new and I hopefully it, it's a little bit easier for you to get. But on the bottom of the project page, there's this thing called the Wyoming 4-H Project Guide. So I'm going to open that up. And what this basically is, is a list of every single project that's offered in the Wyoming 4-H program and the curriculum that goes with it. So here's the aerospace. It gives a little blurb about what it is. And then it tells you about the curriculum that's associated with it. Most of the projects will have three to four level-based um, curriculum, and then they'll have a fifth, fourth one, or a third one, depending on how many things there are, that's specifically for an adult. And the adult one is the one that kind of takes and um, allows you to provide experiences for that wide range of young people. So here, if you look at aerospace, it's the Aerospace Adventure Helpers Guide. Um, up here, if you look, it says all of these can be purchased at the 4-H Mall, um, unless that it's noted, and every single county in Wyoming should have one basic set of this if you want to check it out and see what it looks like before you decide to purchase it or um, because it's for educational purposes if your county lets you make copies of it that's another option so there's lots of ways you can use this I would suggest looking at it before you maybe buy it because it may not be exactly what you're looking for like we said there's sometimes when it does work and sometimes when it doesn't so if you look down here there's a beef one um, it has the three levels bite into beef here's the beef leading the charge and then a helper's guide if there's this one with an asterisk under it, it means that that one is available on our website for free. And that's something that either Wyoming wrote as a supplement to the curriculum, or maybe it's um, a, different, a different type of curriculum that's available for free online. If you have a different resource that you think would be better than some of these, please, please feel free to share that with your 4-H um, educator or myself and we can look to add it. But right now what we've done is kind of looked over the curriculum that's available throughout the United States and really pick the things that we think works best for Wyoming. You also may be wondering, how do projects get on this list? Well, in order for Wyoming to have a recognized 4-H project, it has to have, one, a curriculum that goes with it, and two, we have to have at least three to four counties who are actively having youth involved within the program. So one of the new um, curriculums that we added recently, I'm going to just scroll down. You can, once again, access this at any time that you want to. It's on our website, um, is the Llama and Alpaca Project. So you'll see there, the Llama and Alpaca Project has three books that go with it, and then there's also a helper's guide that's free online if you want to look at that. But we had a lot of people interested. I think there were four counties who were doing llamas and alpacas already, 
and we were able to find a curriculum, so then it became a project. Um, another one that people are often um, confused about too is this outdoor recreation or previously called the recreation project. Once again, we talked about the fact that it has to have a curriculum. And so there's not really a curriculum out there for like dance and sports. So recreation, if you're doing those type of projects would be considered self-determined, which is projects that don't fit anywhere else. If you're looking for outdoor rec, what it is, is hiking, camping, and backpacking. So that's really what the recreation project should entail because recreation itself doesn't have anything to support young people who want to do that. So that, that would be that dancing, outdoor games, things like that would be included down here in our self-determined project, which is projects that don't fit um, anywhere else. So you can see that there's a design my own project where it talks about setting goals and some of the things that we're going to talk about this evening. So are there any questions related to um, the curriculum before we kind of dive in and take a chance to look at what it looks like and how we can use it? Okay, I'm gonna share a different screen this time. I have a camera that we're gonna look at. So here is, um, we're gonna start out just kind of looking at, the swine curriculum is a great way to kind of see what most curriculum looks like. So if you look at this, there are one, two, three levels of curriculum, and then there's a helper's guide, like I said before. With our animal projects, we know that there's also a need to have some more intense um, scientific-based knowledge. So with a lot of them, we have supplemental material, like with swine, we have this one called Exploring Swine Health and Husbandry. So if you're a swine leader and you wanna know the ins and outs of the science behind it, maybe not lesson plans, this is, this basically, this book is all about um, it doesn't have a lot of lessons, it just has a lot of stuff in it that can teach you more about the swine project. So it might be a supplement for you to help teach them. So if we go back to look at this um, one, the first one, a lot of the curriculum looks exactly the same, so we're kind of just going to highlight things. It'll start with a general introduction of what's in there so you know what's happening. And it just has some other things. But if you look here, you'll see that every single piece of curriculum for the most part, especially if it's within the last um, five to ten years is going to have this experiential learning model. That thing we basically talked about is part of every single piece of curriculum, which shows that it's an important thing that we want to make sure we focus on. Um, and then it'll have lesson plans. So here we have lesson one. And so lesson one is called selection and judging. So obviously it's going to be about how you select the right swine and then how you would judge it or what you're looking for when you would judge it. So if you look here, the activity that the young people are going to do is they're going to match swine breed names with descriptions. Uh, the skill set, that project skill we talked about, is they want to recognize breeds. And the life skill is recognizing differences. So you know that wheel that we showed? Um, the great news is that this already tells you what part of that wheel we're actually going to look at. And so if they're successful, they're going to be able to identify eight different breeds. And so if you look here, um, it has, it's hard for me to show, but... Um, it has a list of the breed here. Um, whoop, there you go. It has the list of the breed and some characteristics of it. And you'll find out that at the beginning of the book, it actually had pictures of the swine breeds because they wanted them in color, so they put it at the beginning of the book. So that's there. If you were to teach this to a large group of kids, you may want to look pictures up online or print bigger pictures, or a lot of your offices will have extra support materials for this kind of a lesson. So you'll see they have, it has pages of breeds. And then at the end, it has those questions. So we talked about that do reflect apply model. And the first second one was share and the third one was process. So here it gives you the questions to process that activity. You don't have to think about them. You don't have to create them, it tells you what to do. So, and then it tells you about the generalizing um, questions and then the application questions. So that experiential learning model, life skills is all covered within the curriculum. Then let's say that was a pretty basic activity for the kids that you have. Every lesson is gonna have additional things that you can do. Here it's called more challenges. So you can make, make a mix and match pig game that they can take home with them. Um, you can have them interview three people um, about uh, what they think makes a good guilt or sow. And let's say that you wanna do that as part of your meeting. So bring three people in um, as experts or have them talk over Zoom or on the phone and have them the kids ask them questions during your meeting. So basically, you can take the stuff that's in here and make it more applicable to a much larger audience. So this interview with three people might not sound like the best idea, but bringing three people in who have swine knowledge and having the kids ask them general questions would be a great way to be able to do that more challenges um, within your project. So, and basically it happens, every single one is gonna be very much the same. So here's the second lesson. They're gonna identify body parts. Um, 
and they're learning through games as their life skill. And if they're successful, they're going to identify the cards. I'm not going to go through all these. Once again, this curriculum is at your office. You want to look at them. I just want you to see kind of how the curriculum looks so you would know how to use it and what you could do with it at a meeting or if your kid was working on it on their own. So the photography curriculum is a little bit newer, so you'll find out that it's a little bit differently um, set up, but if you, it's colored. But if you look at the beginning of this book, same thing, you're gonna find that experiential learning model. Once again, very important part of what we're doing, so it's included in every single one of our project books. So this one, you'll find is a little bit more self-study organized. So these are just what's gonna happen. And you'll see it has a lesson one. And the lesson one is about your first photo shoot. Um, and so what you're going to do is the outcomes on this one are a little bit farther down the page. So if you can read that, it says the skill you're going to learn is getting to know your camera. And the life skill is acquiring and evaluating information, obtaining information from valid outcomes. If you're a homeschooler, this is great too because it actually has learning standards on the newer curriculum. And then once again, success indicators. So it's the exact same thing that we had before. It's telling you what you're going to teach the young people, and then it goes step by step through what you're going to do. You're going to do a photo shirt, shoot and see how many things um, you can identify, how many of these the parts of your camera has. You're going to take some pictures, and then the same thing happens here. What are the things that can you do? The more challenges to make it a little bit even better. And then it'll have a review. So this review, once again, has process, generalize, apply. So really, everything is included in here for you. You don't want them to answer questions by writing them. These are the things you can talk about um, within your group and have the kids process together as a group. So once again, the same thing on the next page, it has all the same stuff. So every, like I said, every curriculum is gonna look very much the same. However, to get it old school, not every curriculum is new. And that's because some things don't change. So Leathercraft, this curriculum, I think, if I looked at it, is from 1986, so it's older than some of you on here probably, um, older than some of our educators, but leather doesn't really change that often. The tools are the same, the things we do are the same, and this curriculum itself is very project-based. So the older the curriculum is, the different it's going to be. So if you're going to teach leather craft, you may have to be a little more creative in figuring out that other um, do reflect apply stuff, but for the most part, it's going to do less than playing golf. So once again, remember, this is from the, I think this is actually probably from the 60s and this was updated in 1980. But it's gonna have those same basic skills. It's gonna teach you about how to use the swivel knife and what that looks like. Um, so you can use this once again to learn those skill sets. And then the back of the Leathercraft curriculum actually has specific patterns you can use to make a coin purse or whatever it is that you want to do. So, so that's a general overview of kind of what curriculum looks like. I'm gonna kick it back here to our slideshow. And as a group, we were able to answer the first few, or I was able to answer the first few questions for you, but I would like you to really think about the last two. And if you could type in the chat box, I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about this. If you're with the group, talk about it. Um, do you think that youth would be interested in using these curriculum books? And if so, why not? And what can we do to adapt them? And then how do you see yourself as a leader or parent able to use these books? So if you want to just take a few minutes, um, I'm going to set up my next part of what's going to happen um, to answer those questions in the chat box, or if you want to talk, that's completely fine too. Um, but kind of let us let me know what you think about the things that you've seen so far. All answers are great answers. Don't have a very chatty group this evening. Anyone, any thoughts to share about, do you think you would be interested or how do you see yourself as a parent or adult using these? When I've talked to other people about this, I think that um, the great news is that it gives youth a way to actually have an outlet to learn something. Um, 
Yep. And uh, Tara just put something down that said um, that people prefer hands-on learning more than the curriculum books, which I totally agree with. But she also wrote that there's some things that you can do to jumpstart projects. And I think that's what I wanted to talk about today is that this may not be the best way to present um, all the materials to young people, especially if you have a leader. But you're right. It's a great supplement. It's a great way to find some of those resources that you may not think of. And I'm going to walk through the books and actually show you how the how to actually find those things. Um, someone else said that it would be great for a youth that doesn't have a leader um, and a great starting point. And so I think that's the key is that this is really great um, for kids that don't have a place to start and also to supplement your thing. Um, box curriculum is helpful when using new project areas and easy to add to monthly project meetings. And um, someone said their son's been struggling with read cattle shows and how to go about it. We looked at the books online, but did not know there's a copy in our extension office. So we'll be tracking those out. Yes. Um, and if they don't have one, have your extension office call me. Two years ago, we updated curriculum in every office. Um, so if your staff member has changed, we may need an opportunity for you to be able to get some new books, but we can do that for you. So, um, and someone just did say that they, kids who get burnt out from school work may not want to do book work. And I think I agree with that also. However, just remember, you don't have to have them actually fill it out. You can just use it as a way to guide your project. So speaking of that, let's take a look at what that kind of might look like. So thanks everybody for your feedback. I really appreciate that because I think it's good to get everybody's feedback and what's going on. So some of the things that you can use your the curriculum for is how to help you set goals. Most of the books at the beginning have a goal setting section. Um, goal setting really helps you as a leader know what kind of things your kids want to learn and helps kids think long term about what they're doing. Um, you can help get demonstration ideas from the curriculum. You can create judging classes from the curriculum. Uh, you can create skill -thon stations from the curriculum. Youth can use the curriculum to, find, to make up quiz bowl questions, to do quiz bowls for each other. You can get field trips ideas, and you can create projects for the fair. So I just want to show you um, to find it here. Like I said this is a, quite the... So if you look at the curriculum for the leader, I think that's the one we didn't have a chance to check out. So here's that swine helper guide. If you look in here, it has some great things like, um, let me put the right thing before I start. Exploring the meat counter. So this would be where you could actually take a trip to the meat counter. Um, how to set up a quiz bowl for your swine project. So it's right there within the book. So it actually gives you that idea so you can do that with your project meeting. How to have a skill -a -thon with your swines. So that's right in there with this book. Um, organizing a clinic. How do you do that as a large group? So this one is really based more towards how to do that as an adult um, helping young people. So really look at those helpers guides for ideas for big group projects. Um, I just kind of want to go through some of the things that I just talked about. Um, this one? Okay, so if we look at the idea of a demonstration. So a demonstration is basically a way for members to present with visual aids and, and teaching skills to show a friend or someone else how to, how to do something like tie a knot, take a picture, or play cribbage. Those are all examples of demonstration. So if you look at the curriculum, you could have the young people pick something that's one of the lessons and they could use that to help basically teach their kids. So if we're looking at swine, they may wanna do breeds, they could use the pictures that are in there and maybe get them blown up bigger, ask their extension office if they have a copy. And then they have all the information already about all six of those breeds that were covered that they can present as part of a demonstration. So it's a great way for kids to get ideas to be able to do that. Um, it also can help create judging classes. And for those of you who may not be familiar with, um, you may be familiar with like a judging class for animals, but you may not be familiar that you can do judging classes with basically any um, project. So a judging class is basically just a way for them to make choices. Um, so you give them four different, you give them a scenario and you give them four different things they're looking at and they have to pick which one is the best, second best, third best, and worst, just like if you're judging a class of pigs. So one example that I found um, was that I made up was this one for dog feed. So in the curriculum, um, it talks about what kind of feed you're going to feed your dog, depending if it's a puppy or an older dog. It's in the third book. Um, and so what I did was found four food labels online, or you could have them bring in food labels, whatever is easiest. 
and gave them the scenario that they have an older dog who's having trouble maintaining their weight. Um, and so then they can basically look at these different, um, and through the curriculum, they would have learned that to gain weight, they need fat, fiber, and protein. So if you look at these four curriculums, which one's going to be the best for that aging dog um, and which one's going to be the worst? And so you can have them rank that. And if you really want to get exciting, you can have them give you reasons as to why they did that. So that public speaking skill. Um, this is a great intro if you have kids who want to do produce judging or horse judging, all that stuff. And I'll give you some more resources on where to find this. But I think if you can look at the curriculum and look for ways that you have to make choices or make decisions, um, and you can look at the life skill if it says decision making, that's a great one that you can make into a judging class. So another one is a skillathon, and for those of you who may not be familiar with the skillathon, it's basically like setting up a bunch of stations where the young people go and they either go within another adult or group of kids, and they're going to do the activities hands-on on their own. So we talked about hands-on learning being, being more fun. So setting up skillathon stations with the curriculum is a great way to make that a little bit easier for young people to do. So um, one of them that I created was this cat caution. So there's a picture, and you could. Um, this is exactly, I'll show you, it's actually taken directly from the curriculum. And I just made it bigger and asked the kids to work as a group to talk about what hazards are there, there's six of them, and then ask them to think about other ones that may be available in their home and they could talk about. So basically the CAT curriculum in the first book, you'll see here it's right there. I just basically took that picture from the lesson about um, safety and management copied that picture and was able to make it into a skill found that you could put on a board and kids could just go around and do that person who having to be the one that leads them. Or this is one where a young person could lead another young person to create this activity. So super easy to do. Another one, skill funds are actually probably the easiest thing to do when it comes to looking at the curriculum. So another one that was created from curriculum, hang on, I have to get to the right thing is this is from the health curriculum. It's um, from the book called um, Keeping Fit. So there it is where you can see it. Um, it's a page about optimum performance and it talks about stretches. And so I basically literally just copied and pasted those stretches from the book and then asked the group to work together. They could do those stretches and then they could figure out what muscle group they're stretching. Neck, leg, it should say spine instead of spig. Um, legs, chest, arms, or shoulders. So super easy to take that right out of the curriculum and use it as a skill found or as a group activity. Another one that's one of my favorites is um, the rocket one. This is the first lesson in the aerospace curriculum. I've used it like tons of places because it involves food and who doesn't love food? So um, basically you have a bag of Hershey Kisses, a bag of gummies, a bag of marshmallows, and a bag of toothpicks, and young people make a rocket from those things and the curriculum actually shows you how to do it so you can make this a little bit more, um, you could show them a little bit better through an example and then ask you to draw a picture of the rocket and label the three parts, but then they get to eat what they're done with. But this is literally directly from the first page of the curriculum. I just copied and pasted it so that young people could use that in a group setting. These are, skill funds are also a great way to introduce different projects to your club if your club maybe only does a few things that this is a great way to show them the other things that are involved in the 4-H project. The last example I want to show you is this is um, from the electricity curriculum. Um, it's about magnets and magnetic force. And so basically you get a magnet um, and a bunch of different objects and the young people predict what they think will be attracted to the magnet and then they can actually try it out and see if their prediction was right. So you can have these little magnet attraction test handouts there and the kids can write on them. Um, and then they could even bring their own things or test their own things to see if they're magnetic. But super easy way to make this a bigger group activity using the curriculum. Also, um, we talked about using the curriculum to write quiz bowl questions so they can go through um, and you could have them all write two questions from the chapter that you just covered. Um, and then they can have a quiz bowl. Uh, quiz bowls are always more fun if you actually have buzzers. So I wanted to share with you a find that I found probably about five or six years ago that's awesome. These are called Eggtastic buzzers or something like, it starts with egg, and you can find them on Amazon, that picture is directly from Amazon. And they're actually super cheap compared to regular buzzers. So if your club is looking for something to purchase, you can buy the ones, these are the wireless ones, they're about $82 for the set, or you can buy the ones with wires and they're only 40 bucks. 
seems like a lot, but the actual big set of buzzers is like two or three hundred dollars. So this is a great buy if you're looking to have quiz bowls with your 4-H club meeting or at your project meeting. And most of the time, you could probably ask your club to pay for these, or some county may even have the money to be able to buy a few to rent out to different clubs. So it's always more fun if you have something that makes noises and lights up. And so these work that way. And we have a set here at the office that you could borrow too if you wanted to. You can also use the curriculum to identify field trips. We talked about that. Um, there was the meat counter one. So going to the meat locker or going to a grocery store looking at meat, that's gonna be part of the curriculum. And of course, it's gonna give you ideas for some fair projects. It may not give you the step-by-step -step ideas, but it's gonna give you ideas of how to make those fair projects. So all of that is in there so that you don't have to start from scratch. If you don't know a lot, you wanna look for ways to actually teach some of the materials to you. The curriculum is a great way to do that. So we talked about maybe the curriculum doesn't work all the time. So there are some other things that I want to share with you that are good resources. Um, and then here's a list of them, but I'm just going to go through and show them to you um, on our website and where they're located. So we're going to go back to that website that I showed you before. And this was the project page. So all of the projects are now organized um, based on one of different categories. So let's look at the expressive arts category. That's going to include cake decorating, crocheting, fabric and fashion, interior design, knitting, leather craft, photography, quilting, rope craft, visual arts, and woodworking. So all of these project pages have what's called a project sheet on them. So if we look at interior design, we'll just pick that one because it's there. Um, it's going to have a basic explanation of what you're going to learn in the project. This is actually directly from the curriculum. So that way, if you have a young person who wants to learn about interior design and they don't have a leader, they can know these are the things they're going to learn if they use the curriculum. Then it's going to have this project. It's going to have how to find the curriculum if you need to purchase it or if you want to buy it. And then it's going to have a project information sheet. So if you click on this, once again, this exists for every project in Wyoming currently. It's going to tell you again what it's all about. And then these are the levels that are listed in the curriculum of things that you can learn through the curriculum. But that's not the part I think is important for you as leaders. I think this next, the second page is important. Here are some tours or ways that you can take it further if you're looking for other things to do that aren't listed in the curriculum that you may be wondering, what else can I do? It has an entire list of things you could exhibit at the fair so that we don't get 37 posters of breeds of pigs. The swine one has a list of a whole bunch of things. Or maybe with the interior design, we don't get 37, I love the number 37. We don't get that many um, wall hangings. Here's a whole list of things you can do. It also tells you how you can help young people enhance communication skills through demonstration ideas or other ways that you can talk about your project. It tells you how to do that generosity, getting involved with community service and citizenship, and then how you can do leadership within that project. So once again, this exists currently um, as of probably two months ago for every single project in the Wyoming 4-H program. So if you're looking for more ideas or you have a young person who's just getting started and wants to know what kind of things they can do, this is a great resource to share with them. If you're gonna go out and do a community event and you wanna tell people more about shooting sports or whatever the project is, take a pile of these with you so that you can share that so people can understand what they might be able to get involved with if they do become part of that project. Of course, if, you, um, if you're struggling on what to do with the, the project, you could always ask an expert. That's a great way to be able to find out more about it. So invite someone in, like we talked about that interview, invite someone in that you could interview about a different project or go visit them or have them um, do some type of PowerPoint or you can even do Zoom. We can get you access to something like this if you, they are able to come. So if you wanna ask somebody from the East Coast to talk to your group, um, your extension office can hook you up with Zoom to be able to do something similar to this. Um, I don't like to promote Pinterest, but I think that's a great way to find, I mean, is it research space? There's a lot of junk on there, but there's also a great way to find some 4-H projects. So it's a great way to find some extra resources or additional things that people have done at project meetings that worked out really well. Um, other states have great stuff on their website. We've tried to adapt as much as we can, but I used to work in Missouri, and I think they have something that I want to share with you to make sure that you possibly use it if you're interested in finding some more stuff. So on a lot of their projects, and so this is just the Missouri 4-H website under projects and opportunities, um, this one's cake decorating. They have actual judging classes pre-made and skill upon stations pre-made, so you don't have to think about them. So if you click on this judging class, it's going to basically produce for you a PDF and it's going to have the four choices made up. So here's their, their, um, here's their issue. It says photos of real items. Oh wait, that's what you need. So 
here's a judging class. You're getting ready to make a birthday cake for your mom, but you want to add some color. Which type of color will be the best to use for a buttercream icing? Place the items below in the best to worst option. So here they have pictures on this. You can just print this out and you can bring this to your meeting. And then it actually provides you with the list. D is first, A is second, C is third, and B is fourth. And it tells you why. So it's a great resource to be able to not have to recreate the wheel if you're looking for some judging classes that you can do at your project meetings. Um, it has a similar thing for a uh, skill fund stations. So skill fund stations are where you're going to do hands-on activities more than you're actually going to um, make decision-making choices. So this one is called um, Swag Style Cake Borders. So here it tells you what supplies you're going to need if you're going to offer this to young people, what the situation is, and then having them actually do it. And so you could just put this out. If you had this, the supplies there, you put this up, and then the kids can actually do on um, the different skill fund stations. So on the Missouri 4-H website, they actually have a lot of these different ones, and they have project briefs, too. They're probably not quite as descriptive, and they're more for Missouri. So I don't know that I, you could use them, but um, the project briefs are going to be much better on our page. However, the judging classes and skill funds are great because you don't have to recreate the wheel. And if you're running late and haven't had time to plan a meeting, it's a great place to go to be able to get those. And then, of course, um, you can always ask your 4-H educator. They're going to be a great resource to tell you if there's other information out there or things that they have found that they enjoy using. Um, web searches are good. Just be careful to make sure that it's something that probably is credible and not going to give you a bunch of information that maybe isn't the best source um, to use, which is why we suggest using other states' um, extension pages because they're going to have information that's definitely been tested um, and made sure that it's okay. So that is all I have today for using the curriculum. If there's any questions, um, feel free to either ask them or write them in the chat box. Um, I'd love to learn more about if you are using the curriculum in a positive manner, if you have things that you want to share, um, please feel free to do that in the chat box also. Um, if you haven't had a chance to write your name and your county in the chat box, be sure to do that so we can get you credit for that also um, for being here and participating in our um, event this evening. So. Hopefully you learned something new and you're able to use the curriculum and know that you have a copy in your extension office. So please go check it out, visit it, see what you can do with it and um, share with others. Once again, this will be recorded. So if you want to share this, these ideas with others or you want to find some of the resources I shared, all this will be posted on the website later this week to be able to use that if you're interested in that, that also. So thanks for coming. And once again, questions or comments and make sure you put your name in there so we can get you um, credit for this. And I appreciate all of you being here. I'm going to stop recording, but once again, I'll stay on for a while. 